Father, we come before you. We ask you just be with us now as we open your word. We pray, Lord, you would let your word speak to our hearts. And Lord, as we, uh, as we consider these things, we pray, Lord, that you would truly work in our midst. It took us 38 chapters to finally get to real wisdom where you answer and you begin to speak. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. I was toying between Psalm 115 and Exhortation Force and Job 38 as I was in the back there. But let's go with a few verses of Job 38. We'll see what the Lord gives us. Then the Lord answered. Now, we've been through a lot of chapters of, of Job, what happened to him, Eliphaz and, and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar and then Elihu. And now, finally, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, this storm that seemed to be brewing as Elihu was giving his answers. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, he's going to ask Job 77 questions. And by the end of 77 questions, Job realized he's completely out of his league. The Lord answered out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge. There's some opinions. Some feel he's rebuking Elihu. Others say he's actually addressing Job. But verse 2, we'll know when we get to heaven, which one. Verse 3, he now begins to ask things of Job. It's divided opinion about who he rebuked in verse 2. They've all had some interesting ideas. But now, verse 3, we know for sure he's beginning to go right to Job. Gird up now thy loins like a man. Be prepared. For I will demand or inquire of thee... And answer thou me. Now, what has Job been saying? Oh, that there was one that could, you know, reach between me, men in between God. Oh, that I might present my case before God. Oh, that I might be weighed in the scales before the Lord. And so now the Lord gives him the opportunity. I'm going to demand of you, Job. I've got some things I'd like to ask you. And you're going to answer me. Verse 4. Where were you? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where was he? Nowhere to be found, right? Okay, interesting, as we work through chapter 38, we'll see day one of creation, day two, day three, day four, and then day five and six as we get through the whole chapter. So really, he starts with the beginning of creation. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? The foundation of the earth was laid on day one. When was man created? Day six. So he's five days late. He wasn't around. Well, of course, that was Adam. It wasn't Job. I know, I know. Where were you, where was thou, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Job's answer is nothing. Verse 5. Who hath laid, that is to put or make or appoint, who has appointed or made the measures, the capacities thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched a line upon it? Who's measured it? Well, now we have some technology to give us a good idea, but back then, if thou knowest. Whereupon were fastened, or are the foundations thereof fastened, what are they attached to, to sink down, to, to drown, to settle in? What are the foundations of the earth in? What are they in? How are they structured? Basically, is the idea. And who laid the cornerstone, basically the, the beginning and the, the work of it? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? The answer? Still nothing from Job. Here's where it gets interesting. When the morning stars sang, literally Boker. How many have been to Israel and heard Boker Tov? How many have heard? Okay, well, it's Boker, morning. When the morning stars sang together, verse 7, interesting, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Chapter 1 and chapter 2, what were the sons of God? The angels. Okay, I'm going to ask you a trick question. On what day did God lay the foundations of the earth? On what day of creation did God lay the foundations of the earth? On what day did God lay the foundations of the earth? Pastor, it's been a long day. We worked all day. We came to church. We're trying to be good. First day, yes? Okay. Who are the sons of God? Angels. So who is singing his praise as he's laying the foundation of the earth? The angels. So what is the most reasonable day to assume the angels were created? Day one. 
Okay, well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, let's consider some things. The angels, all the sons of God, shouted for joy. What it is seemingly telling us is on day one, in the beginning, when God said, let there be light, and there was the earth without form, without form and void, Genesis 1, it appears that that is also the time that God created the angels, and they are singing his praise. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, but pastor, where did demons come from? We'll explain that in a minute. The angelic host was in unity worshiping the Lord on day one. Now, why is that important? Well, turn to Ezekiel chapter 38, right turn, Ezekiel chapter 38. Yeah, we'll get this done. Ezekiel 38. Basically, this evening, with the time we have, we're going to get a quick review of angelology versus demonology. If you've, never been through, if you've never been through systematic theology, don't panic. You're going to get the idea of where did angels, where are they, when did, when did God make them, what's the idea, and then what did the fallen or demonic angels, where did they come from? Uh, sorry, Ezekiel 28, my fault, Ezekiel 28. You're thinking, wow, he's 38 is what's going on in Syria, that's pending. 28 is what happened before in the demonic realm, the angelic realm, my fault. Ezekiel 28, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto him. Now, by the way, this king that is mentioned, we learn in verse 13, was in Eden. So there's no way a king of Tyrus could have been in Eden. We are talking to the realm of the spiritual realm. This is to Satan himself, Lucifer. This is a, a parable or a lamentation against him, a prophecy against him from Ezekiel. So take up. The word of the Lord came to me saying, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been where? In Eden, the garden of God. Question, what day was Eden created? Day six. Everybody still with me? Day one, earth was laid foundations. Day six, God created a garden, put man in the garden, Eden. Eve was there also. Okay, so you have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the stardust, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold, workmanship of thy tabrets. Thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was what? Created. Satan is a created being. Powerful, yes, but just created. Tomatoes are created. They're no match for God. Satan, quite powerful, but only simply created. The creation does not overthrow the creator. But he's so deceived, he's going to try. And the day that thou was created, thou art the anointed cherub. Uh, no king of Tyrus is a cherub. Now you know where we are, angelic realm. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, and thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was, Casey forgot it, another verse, created until iniquity was found in you. So he was in Eden before the iniquity. Where am I going with this? It appears that God created the heavens and the earth. It, well, it not only appears, he gave it to us clearly. Day one creates the heavens and the earth. Day six creates man, creates the Garden of Eden. It appears from Ezekiel 28, Lucifer, this cherubim, somehow had access to it. He was in Eden, and then iniquity was found in him. We don't know. It doesn't tell us what kind of interaction happened. If there was any sort of interaction before his fall, it would explain why perhaps Eve was not so afraid to talk to him. But these are things we find out when we get to heaven. But he was in Eden. He was perfect. And then iniquity was found in you. Verse 16, by the multitude of your merchandise... You have filled the midst of you with violence. You have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you out as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, because your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. His pride destroyed him. You've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. 
Therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it will devour you. And I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all men that behold you. And all they that know you among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. On your way back, stop at Isaiah 14. Left turn. Isaiah 14. What was this iniquity that was found in him? Isaiah records these statements where he was lifted up in his heart. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars, the angelic realm as far as we can tell, stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud, perhaps the very Shekinah glory of God. I will be like the Most High. Who's God, whose job does he want? God's. Here, don't miss this. What does he want? Worship. He wants to be above all. And worshiped. Many feel because of Ezekiel 28 telling us about his pipes and his tabrets that these are musical instruments, and therefore Lucifer before his fall was perhaps involved in the bringing of the worship of the host of heaven to God or somehow instrumental in doing that. And so it mentions these particulars about him, and perhaps as he was being used as that vessel to bring this worship to God, he began to corrupt himself, thinking it's not God that they're worshiping, it's because there's something so awesome within himself until you were corrupted by your perfection, your beauty. And so then realizing or getting this idea that he ought to be worshiped, he then destroyed himself, corrupted himself. Iniquity was found in him. And that pride that he ought to have the worship and not God cast him out of that position he had among the fiery stones, among the very holiness of God. He was removed from that. He still has access. He's still the accuser of the brethren. We learned this in Job 1 and 2. But he's lost that position of serving God. And now he is known to us as the devil, Satan, the dragon, and Revelation. 12 tells us in that rebellion, one third of the stars, one third of the angelic realm went with him. So here we get into the book of Job and we find out where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I measured these things of the earth? Where were you when all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? It seems what Job 38 is telling us is that at the beginning of creation, especially day one, the angelic realm was still completely in submission to God. Now, if you've ever read, for example, in 1 Peter, it talks to us there about the fact that the angels marvel. Make sure I have the right text. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1, it talks to us about the angels, they wonder at the things of salvation. Let me explain why. Because the angelic realm created on day one in the presence of God, seeing his glory, serving him in some capacity. Lucifer becoming deceived, self-deceived through his pride, through his arrogance. He falls in his arrogance and rebellion against God. In that fall, he decides to take with him or somehow deceives and convinces one third of the angelic realm to go with him. And now you have holy angels who have been faithful to the Lord. And now you have fallen angels. It's described to us in Jude, angels which kept not their first position or a state, they fell, and in falling, they are now fixed in their rebellion. What do you mean? They made the decision for themselves. You and I were not in the Garden of Eden. You and I did not sit there next to Adam and Eve saying, hey, I'll have a bite of that too. We have inherited their one act of disobedience. Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, by one man's disobedience, sin and death entered the world. So through the righteous life of Christ, his death and resurrection in obedience to the Father gets us out of this death that has come to the world. So Adam brought us in. Jesus brings us out. The reason is it's right before God. We weren't there when we got brought in. And praise God, by another one's work through faith, we can be brought out. But the angels, they chose for themselves. It wasn't someone else telling them. They chose for themselves. And so when they fell into their rebellion... We've learned from Jesus the lake of fire was created for whom? Matthew 25. The devil and his angels. Why? Because they made their choice for themselves to rebel against God. Having beheld his glory, his power, his throne, they decided to go into rebellion. 
And so here in this book of Job, verse 38, chapter 38, verse 7, very interesting, we find right from the beginning, here it appears to be the angels in right standing, and then somewhere between Eden, Lucifer was in Eden, it tells us in the order of Ezekiel, and then iniquity was found in him. So it would seem, we won't know until we get to heaven, day six, he was still right with God. But somewhere shortly after that, he corrupted himself. And with that came warfare, pestilence, famine, birth defect, sin, sickness, disease, etc. That all came in with that act of disobedience on his part and then disobedience and rebellion on man's part. So in the beginning of this, this answer of God to Job, we get an interesting thought. And that is, at least on day one, all the angelic realm were praising God for what he had created. Besides, it tells us throughout, it was good. It was good. It was good. I don't think an angelic rebellion where one third of the angels now fall and become demons would still be listed as good on day one. So we get a little piece of the puzzle. A little piece of the puzzle. Now here's what's coming. Soon, there's going to be war in heaven. Revelation 12, Michael and his angels are going to fight against the devil and his fallen angels. And they're going to be cast down to the earth. He's been cast out of his position, but still has access. But he's going to be cast out of having even access down to the earth. The last three and a half years of human history before the Lord establishes his kingdom. And he's going to begin to just significantly, horrifically persecute Israel. So what we have here is we have this progression created perfect, filled with his own arrogance and pride, decided he would supplant God in his dominion, cast out of his position, deceiving angels with him, now being dropped down to deceive Adam and Eve. You ever have a thought? You remember how the demons, when they see Jesus during his earthly ministry, say, what are we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Anybody ever? Read that? They're pretty animated. Have you read that? Am I the only one? Here's a thought. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He has always existed, yes? The Son has always existed. They used to worship Him. And now He's on the earth in human flesh. Might explain why they were so overwhelmed. The Lord is going to return. The Lord is going to establish his kingdom. Matthew 25, 31 tells us when the Lord comes in his glory with his holy angels. He's going to gather the nations. He's going to divide them like one divides the sheep and the goats. And he's going to say to the goats who clearly did not believe and their works demonstrated their unbelief. Depart from you, work of iniquity, into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't have a lot of time tonight, but I want to challenge you with something. There are only two kingdoms. Kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness are those who feel they can be independent of God and have no need of his salvation. We've learned in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the God of this age. He's blinded the hearts and the minds of men, lest they should believe the light and the glorious gospel. Where is this world heading? He's about to produce his antichrist. What's he going to do with that antichrist? He's going to deceive the nations. What is he going to do with those nations? He's going to gather them, and he's going to seek to have those nations come and worship him. It was the same thing he offered to Jesus. All this will I give to you, Luke 4, if you'll fall down and worship me. He's been waiting and waiting and waiting for worship. And the last days, there will be a falling away. The church will be suddenly removed. Then will come that lawless one, antichrist, with all lying signs signs and wonders, 2 Thessalonians 2, and he is empowered by Satan who uses these things to finally get what he has been trying to achieve for himself from very early in creation. He wants to be worshipped. No other generation has been closer to seeing these final few things unfold than ours. There are only two kingdoms, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness. You didn't get yourself into this darkness. Adam did it to us. But Jesus is here this evening, and if you open your heart to him as your Savior, he will get you out of this darkness. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we consider these things and get into Job 
these answers from you to him. And there are some profound statements that could not be known by any human being at the time that these were recorded. Clearly, it is your voice speaking to us. Lord, thank you that the creation you made, it is good. And it's going to be redeemed. You will sit on the throne. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Mercy and truth will reign together. Righteousness will fill the world. You will bring forth, Lord, that promise to David that the Son of God will sit on the throne of David and rule and reign. Lord, what interesting times we live in. May our hearts be open to you. And Lord, I do pray for anyone here this evening that doesn't know you. Let this evening be finally the time they realize if they're not in the light, they're in the darkness. And you desire for them to come to you. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us that you are the light of the world. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the light. And no man comes to the Father but through you. Go with us this evening, we pray in Jesus' name.